Okay, uh, time to drink from the fire hose, y'all. Uh, we're gonna start with medical terminology. Uh, just basically, medical terminology allows us to communicate at the level that doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals communicate at. It's a level of specificity that is recognized in the medical community, but not absolutely necessary. It's just a lot of it is this mental elevation, right? So we use medical terminology to properly explain what system's hurting, what's wrong with the system, how a patient's positioned. We use specific words. I think a lot of it's in, uh, originated in Latin. Um, and sometimes it's used to kind of mask the, real, the, the common meanings of things so we can talk about a patient in front of a patient without them knowing sort of what we're talking about. So it's a little bit of this like elevation. But for the most part, it's just medical terminology is designed to clearly explain a problem with a patient or a presentation of a patient. Um, so we're going to start with some pretty simple stuff like anatomical positions. Has everyone seen the Michelangelo guy, anatomical position? This is your anatomical front, all right, with your palms open, your thumbs up, and your feet slightly spread apart. So everything you see on the and this is anatomical, like it has to do with the body. So anatomical positions is usually explain how we find a patient or how we uh, transport a patient. And the, probably the most comfortable one for patients is supine. And that means lying on your back. That's a supine patient. Um, and then prone, prone's the bad one. Prone is face down. We need to correct patients when they're found prone. So we try to get them into the supine position from prone. Uh, and then we have left and right lateral recumbent, which is, you know, fetal position kind of on your side. And that's a position of comfort for a lot of people in abdominal pain. Uh, next we talk about Fowler's, and there's Fowler and semi-Fowler's. Um, they're sort of interchangeable, but semi-Fowler's means either a 45 degree or less with their legs extended. So this is right at the Fowler's aspect. If they had gone down a little bit, that's semi-Fowler's. And then 45 degrees up to 90 degrees would be full Fowler's. Um, there's left and right lateral recumbent. And then finally, a term that we, um, that we love in EMS is Trendelenburg. Trendelenburg means that the legs are elevated above the heart and the whole body is kind of at a downward angle, the head being the lowest part. Anyone want to give a guess as to why Trendelenburg is useful and helpful? Yeah, I heard her. Blood pressure. This moves via gravity. This moves all the, a lot of excess blood from the lower extremities, the legs, and pushes it towards the core of the body or the torso, and that's where all of our vital organs are. All right, there's going to be a little bit of repeat on this, but here's our anatomical planes. Uh, okay, I lost my image, but that's all right. Your medial plane divides the body into the left and right at the midline. So your medial plane cuts you right down the middle at your belly button, also known as your umbilicus, and, and that's going to cut you left and right. Versus the sagittal plane, um, which can be a, a line that can cut you in left and right sections anywhere else except for the midline. So this is your medial plane. So if something is medial, it's towards the midline. The sagittal planes that we use are usually the mid-clavicular uh, line, which kind of cuts down the side of each uh, half of the torso. Uh, the frontal or coronal plane, I think more people are using frontal now because we've heard the C word enough in the last two and a half years. Uh, the frontal plane divides uh, the body into the front and the back, also known as the anterior and the posterior. So now I'm barely going to say the front of someone's body. I'm going to be always using the anterior. And I'm not going to say they're behind. I'm going to say they're posterior. And again, I want you to always think of that Michelangelo image, palms forward, thumbs up, as your anatomical front. So this is actually the anterior aspect of my hand, and that's the posterior, right? If you get confused, just think of a backhand. That was like a threat. That was like the nicest threat ever, right? Um, yes, we call the line down the side of the chest the mid-axillary line. And that's where if we have to pop someone's uh, pleural cavity or where their lungs are, we poke them on their mid-axillary line. 
And then a transverse plane divides the body into upper and lower aspects. And again, we're going to stop saying upper and lower. We're going to say superior towards your head or inferior down by your feet. So a good, a good way to think about this is we divide the abdominal, the abdomen into four sections. And we use uh, the midline or the medial plane. And then we use the transverse line across the umbilicus, your belly button. So then I have my right upper right lower, left upper, left lower, across that little target right on my belly button. Questions? All right, oh, here's my guy. There he is, hello. Uh, again, I just already kind of explained this, but we have the anterior aspect of a person and then the posterior aspect of a person, right? And then uh, we talked about the medial line, and anything medial is closer to that midline, and then anything further away is lateral. So my shoulder is lateral, my belly button is medial, right? Lateral is further away from the midline, and then the, the middle is our medial aspect. We talked about superior towards the head or inferior towards the feet. And then when we get to extremities, we start using these two terms, distal and proximal. All right, distal means further away from the torso. All right, so my finger is distal. My elbow is proximal to my finger. And then my bicep is proximal to my elbow. So my elbow is also distal to my bicep. Does everyone understand? Further away, it's distal. As we get closer, things get proximal. Uh, ventral and dorsal, these are interesting terms. It basically means anterior and posterior. We don't use them very much except when we're talking about internal organs. So sometimes you'll have the dorsal aspect of your lungs, which is the, the, the aspect of the lungs towards the back, right? And you can just remember this by when you breathe or you're ventilating, ventral, your chest expands. And then you think about a dolphin they've got, or a shark, they've got that dorsal fin on their back quick way to remember those. Uh, when we're talking about injuries, we can talk about a superficial or a deep injury. A superficial injury would be a little scratch on the surface anywhere on the body, and then a deep injury would actually be penetrating, so it goes further inside of us. Apex and fundus, we're not really going to talk about that. Uh, plantar and palmar, the plantar aspect of your feet are on the bottom of your feet. It's a real tricky one because if you think of anatomical position, the feet are just kind of hanging out down there, so we use the X, the, the term planter for the bottom of our feet. Palmer has to do with the hands. So the palmer aspect of your hand. That would again would be posterior on the back of the hand. A couple confusing terms here, ad abduction and adduction. Abduction is motion of an extremity away from the midline. So if you extend your arms out or rotate your hands away, that is abduction. And then adduction is motion towards the midline. And this is more of that rotation, right? If I'm bringing my arms across my chest, that is adduction. If you want to spread your wings and fly, you're abducting. Cool? Uh, extension and flexion, pretty obvious when you extend your muscles. Again, you go away from your midline, extend a leg, that's extension, and then flexion is when you flex up. Okay, and just think about when you're working out of the gym. Flexing, you're doing your curls and you bring muscles in. And then we have an inversion and aversion. Inversion is a rotation. So if I'm inverting my feet, I'm going to go from exterior to interior. I'm rotating it towards the midline, right? That's inversion, the opposite being eversion. All right, now we start getting into the Latin, the Latin fun stuff. Um, most medical terms start with a prefix. Uh, sometimes you'll just get a, a term that has no prefixes. Uh, but the prefix can describe a bunch of different stuff. It can start with location, uh, a system, or the intensity of a problem. Okay, so if we talk about ex uh, location, we've already learned of the, the ab and the ad. Ab being away, ad being towards, abduction being away, adduction, adding in here. And then we have this idea of below, subdural. Subdural means below the skin. 
um, infrastructure. It's a good example of uh, the structures below the streets, the structures within the buildings themselves is infrastructure. Um, s s around, so we use circum, when we talk about the mouth, circumoral, circumoral cyanosis means that your lips are blue everywhere around your mouth, circumoral is blue. Peri, I use peri when I'm talking about the, around the belly button. It's a specific type of bruise called a periumbilical bruise or periumbilical tenderness and that just means right around your belly button. Para, I guess parachute, it's a good way to get around. I don't I can't think of it. Mm. Uh, across, trans or intra. So intranasal means that you're going in through the nose or across the nose. Intramuscular, across the muscles. Trans, uh, well, there's nicotine patches. Transdermal nicotine patches. You put it on your skin and it goes across the skin, right? Epi and supra means above. If you have a suprapubic uh, catheter, it means that they've drilled a hole above your pubic symphysis, and that's how they're draining the urine out of you through a supra above pubic catheter. Uh huh. And then unilateral and bilateral. So if I'm giving you the thumbs up unilaterally, it's me doing it once. If it's bilaterally, you get both arms. If you're having a unilateral conversation, it's just one person yelling at the same, uh, one person yelling at the other person. It's not back and forth. It's just one-sided. Any questions about those? My advice in this class is that if you hear a term that you're like, what the hell does that mean? Write it down in green, write it down in a different marker or a different color and somewhere on the side of a page so you can try to break it down. It's a really good idea to start generating a list of medical terms that you hear repeatedly and you're like, oh, I should probably know that one. Tachycardia and bradycardia being great examples of that. Um, outside of the medical field, you might know, you might have heard of tachycardia or bradycardia, which don't really know what it means, but those are terms that we're using almost every day when we're talking about patients and their heart rates. So it's a really good idea to start generating your own list. I've started at, about at least 30 or 40 in the classes that I've taken and the classes that I've taught, and I keep on losing them, so I can't just give you the, all, the, all the words you need to have. Um, but if you start hearing a, a, a term over and over, yeah, probably going to hear it, continue to hear it over and over. All right, as far as systems go, it gets a little confusing at this point. So cardio, or cardi, is the Latin term for the heart. So tachycardia, wow, resolution's terrible on that. Uh, tachycardia means a fast heart rate. Uh, and then they start getting a little bit more confusing. Hepato has to do with your liver. Um, so hepatomeglia, meglia means an enlargement, and hepato is the liver, so this is an enlargement of the liver, hepatomeglia, due to all the drinky drinky. Question? Nope. Uh, nephro is your kidneys. There's actually nephrons within your kidneys, which are little things that pull all the, the fluid out of your bloodstream and then slowly put it back in. So whenever you hear nephro, then you're talking about the kidneys. Nephropathy is a disease. Pathy being disease. Nephropathy is a disease of the kidney. Neuro is probably the easiest of them. Neurological, neuro, uh, is, that has to do with your nerves. Uh, how we transmit information to and from our brain is with our nerves. So a neuro deficit would be something wrong with our nerves. When we're looking at a stroke patient, we ask about neuro deficits, and deficits are permanent problems. Um, psych or psyche, psycho, uh, it has to do with your mind, how your mind functions, versus all those normal people out there screwing it up for everyone. So if you're a psychologist, you are studying, or a doctor of how the mind functions. Um, and then thorac, thoraco is your chest. Uh, so a thoracic, the thoracic area is having to do or pertaining to your thorax, your chest. Dun, 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 dun. Here's a bunch more. 
uh, yeah, then you can see that uh, the, the reason I made this list, you don't have to memorize these, but I just want to show you how confusing it can be. Uh, there's an angio angino, right? They're two totally different things. Cerebro and costo. This is not Costco, it's costo. Um, and it's all kind of escalates to the point where you have an anesthetist and an aesthetician and an anesthetist are two totally different things, right? Um, one of them helps keep you subdued when you're having surgery, keeps you under, and the other one makes your face look pretty and your nails and your hair. So they're two totally different things. Uh, but here's a, a wonderful list of confusing terms. Brachio and bronchio, they look very similar, but brachio is this muscle, bronchio is your chest and your lungs. All right. So just understand that using these terms can get confusing. Um, if, you, uh, if you see two words that look similar, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they mean the same thing. Prefixes can also indicate the intensity of a, a, a function, um, how well it's actually performing. So if we have an A before a system or an A before a, a root word or an AN, that means that there's an absence, all right? Asystole, asystole is a heart rhythm. And if I said, Systole, remember we talked about systole, right? Systole is the what? You said it. Yeah, contraction of the heart muscles, right? So let's put an A in front of it. A systole, what does that mean? Yeah, it's not doing anything. That's your flatliner, right? There's no heartbeat, there's no electrical activity. A systole means cardiac arrest. That heart is not moving, not pumping, not doing anything, right? Great, good work. Uh, DYS is dysfunctional or maybe even painful. So dyspnea means uh, any type of breathing. The P-N-E-A means it has to do with the respirations. Dyspnea means a dysfunctional or painful breathing. And then dysuria, I'll give you one guess. Yeah, it's the burning after a weekend. Um, I have to remember I'm being recorded here. So. And there's a microphone clipped to my face. Um, so hyper and hypo are, are commonly misunderstood for each other, right? Hyper and hypo, one of them means uh, that it is excessive or a high number value. Hyper, uh, hypertension is high blood pressure. And then oppositely, hypotension is low blood pressure, okay? Hyperemesis means that you are throwing up like a machine, you are spraying the walls and the ceilings and the paramedic and the EMT and the driver uh, or anyone at the back of the, uh, out the back of the ambulance. Hyperemesis. Hyperventilation is a term that most of us know and that means that you're breathing very, very rapidly. You're, you're, you're moving too much air. Versus hypo, which is below normal, uh, insufficient or under. Hypoxia, oxia, because it starts with an O, it means oxygen, but we don't put two O's in there. We don't say hypoxia, we say hypoxia. Uh, and that means low blood oxygen. And of course, hypotension would be low blood pressure. Does anyone remember from Wednesday what, constant, what value for your systolic blood pressure constitutes hypotension? Mm -hmm. Below 100 on your systolic blood pressure constitutes medical hypotension. Those get confused with tacky and with brady a lot. So tacky, first of all, means fast. And we'll talk about tachycardia. Tachycardia means you have a fast heart rate. And let's think back to Wednesday. What is, what is tachycardia? What value would you place above 100? Yep, above 100 is tachycardia. You're okay. Oh, yeah. I was thinking blood pressure. You're thinking blood pressure, yeah. But if your pulse is above 100, you're technically experiencing tachycardia. Brady, on the other hand, means slow. So bradycardia would be below 60. Um, the fun one is when we add breathing, the P-N-E-A, pnea, 
Tachy, uh, tachypnea is how that's pronounced. It's not tachypnea. Tachypnea. And then bradypnea. One of my former students wanted it to be tachypnea and bradypnea, which I thought was really cute, but it's not. It's tachypnea and bradypnea. Uh, and then we got pre and post, before and after, pre and post surger surgicals. Now there's a bunch of other prefixes, but these are the ones I need you to know. All right, these are the ones that have to be kind of solidified in there. And these are some great examples that I use almost every day. Not dysuria, but uh, hypertension, hypoxia, tachypnea. Those are all terms that quickly establish that there's a problem and what the problem is, right? Uh, the prefixes can also indicate what color we're dealing with. And this is mostly has to do with skin um, and, we'll, as we'll see, uh, some organs. So cyano is the first one I need you to know, and cyano indicates blue. Cyanosis is a skin condition when we don't have enough oxygen in our blood. You know, our, our fingers, our lips, our nose, our circumoral area around the mouth all ex can, can express cyanosis, and that means blue skin. All right, and it's a very clear, a uh, very clear image of someone who needs oxygen. When someone is oxygen starved, if one of the things that we see immediately is cyanosis around the nose, the mouth, and in babies, newborn babies, their entire body can be blue until they really start oxygenating themselves. So knowing that that bluish tint to color uh, to the skin is called cyanosis is really important. Leuco means white and erythro means red. We use these when we're talking about blood cells. White blood cells and red, red blood cells are leukocytes and erythrocytes. Um, Sero, anyone think about a yellow, a yellowing that has to do with sero? Liver cirrhosis, right? And those people actually present with jaundice. Their entire skin will turn this bright yellow but they call it liver cirrhosis because uh, the, the skin and the liver becomes very yellow. Melano is black, melanoma. Melanomas are skin cancers and they present as little black spots little, um, on the skin. Polio, um, polio is gray. There we go, and albo is wile, the color wile, the color white. There, albo, and a good example of that is an albino, albino. And chloro is green. If you start turning green, there's all types of problems. I can't even diagnose that. That's pretty much it for the prefixes. Again, cyanosis is a term I want you to start using when, you're, uh, when you see blue skin, cyanosis. Uh, some suffixes, actually our suffixes can do a bunch of stuff. Uh, they can talk about a procedure, a condition, or even a disease of one of those root words. All right. Itis is probably the most famous of them. Everyone knows um, itis when they come into my class. Itis is inflammation, so you have swelling. It's usually indicative of an infection. Tonsillitis, bronchitis, conjunctivitis. A whole bunch of different itises, and it literally just means some type of infection or swelling. I'm going to close this door one second. Dun 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 dun. Me 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 me. Yeah, ready to go. Um. Epiglottitis, dermatitis. Uh, epiglottitis is the swelling of the epiglottis, and dermatitis is on the skin itself. Uh, so again, the, this inflammation or the swelling is usually indicative of some type of infection. Uh, the suffix al means that it's pertaining to, so like oral or costal. Costal margin is your ribs, the edge of your ribs, costal. Intercostal space is between your ribs. Costal has to do with your ribs. Syncopal means uh, having to do with syncope. And syncope is the f when you're not 
Getting enough oxygen to your brain and you pass out, otherwise known as fainting. We rarely say the term fainting. In the medical world, we say stuff like syncope, because it's so fancy. Oh, syncope. Mm. I'm off to play the grand piano. Um, algia is pain. Uh, fibromyalgia is a commonly diagnosed unknown pain in the body, knees, legs, arms, movement of any kind causes fibromyalgia, and fibromyalgia is pain. Um, the ectomy means that it's probably gone through so much itis that it had to be removed. So let's think about your tonsils. You have tonsillitis, they become swollen and and they're infected, so you need to get a tonsillectomy, which means that they gotta cut them out, get them out of you like grenades and throw them across the room. Uh, versus ostomy, again, very similar. Ostomy is a, a surgical opening or a stoma, like a colonostomy. It doesn't mean that they've cut out your colon, it means they've drilled a hole in your body because it's an ostomy, not an ectomy. A colonectomy means that they're cutting out your entire colon. Colonostomy means that you're now pooping in a bag. Which uh, could be convenient, if you think about it. Certain circumstances, it's just like, well, fine for now. Um, you see the, pa the uh, prefix, uh, or the suffix of IC, it just means that it's pertaining to that. This is the topic that we're talking about. Gastric ulcers are ulcers that have to do with your stomach in your digestive system. Orthopedic has to do with your bones. And then we got the folks that study stuff, ology and ologists, or logi and logists. So hematology, hemo being blood, hematology is the study of blood. A hematologist practices hematology. Megaly, we've already looked at. Megaly means it's enlarged. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. It's usually, again, some type of disease where the uh, cells are reproducing too quickly, and an organ will grow to abnormal size. It can also do to muscle enlargement. Uh, cardiomegaly means that your heart muscles have gotten bigger than the normal Johnny human. So you have an enlarged heart, cardiomegaly. Uh, an oma is a tumor. And then this is this was for a long time a test question. The definite the suffix for disease is pathy. A lot of times when you think about disease, you start thinking about itis. But itis is, is indicative of inflammation. But pathy, cardiomyopathy, is the disease of the heart muscle. And we can start breaking this down. Cardio being heart, myo being muscle, cardiomyopathy is a disease of the heart muscle. You got the whole thing. Right there, in one confusing package. Uh, a gram, like an electrocardiogram, the EKG, a gram is a recording. Doesn't necessarily mean how much it weighs. Electrocardiogram just is recording of the electrical conduction through the myocardium. The myo being your muscle, cardio being your heart. Myocardium electrocardiogram, studying the heart muscles. Um, osis is a disease process. If someone's having uh, cardiomyopathy or cardiomegaly, uh, then it would be cardios, cardiomegalos, megalosis. All right, so there's, there's the whole progression of that disease, right? That's the, the path in which a, a disease takes. We've got two more confusing ones, phagia and phagia. Phagia has to do with eating and swallowing, and phasia is speech. All right, so dysphagia would be painful or dysfunctional speech, or aphagia would be lack of eating. You cannot eat. 
hear how similar they sound, how similar they look. They also both have to do with the mouth to a degree, but one is formulating speech, phasia, aphasia, someone who doesn't talk, can't speak, and dysphagia, someone who has trouble eating. And uh, pnea uh, has to do with breathing. Dyspnea is trouble breathing or labored breathing. Apnea is no breathing. Tachypnea is tacky, means it's fast. Brada bradypnea, uh, pneumonia has to do with that also. P N E. Uh, then we got aragia and rhea, when you're sliding in first. Aragia is excessive flow or discharge like rhinoragia. Rhino being your schnoz. Rhinoragia means that you are just blowing your nose and it's rolling on out of there. Like little, little sick kiddos have rhinoragia because their nose is all bubbly and blowing the snot bubbles. It's really cute. Uh, versus rhea, which is an unusual flow or discharge. There's really only... One example I can think of. Yeah, it's diarrhea. He's lying. In. Yeah, that's the one. It's where your butt's flowing, unusually. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> diarrhea, it's a medical term. Uh, stasis means a slowing or stopping versus staxis is dripping. And then taxis is the order or arrangement. So, uh, Uh, I'm trying to remember what this one cerebr cerebral cerebral ataxia ataxia cerebral ataxia means that uh, you're not flowing your nerves are not moving in the right direction and you're not getting cerebral spinal fluid flowing in the right direction so stasis just think of a stasis pod where everything is slowed down or stopping Staxis, uh, we use that when we talk about bloody noses. Uh, and then, I don't think I've ever seen the taxis in my career. I've never stated that term. Um, we're going to learn a lot about homeostasis, which is how we return to a normal functioning or how the body maintains its normal functioning. Um, so once you start seeing these suffixes more and more, they are going to start sinking in. Aphasia and aphagia, especially. Um, so, and then I guess poly is important, because I just wrote this part. Poly means excessive. So polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. Dipsia is uh, your thirst. Uh, poly meaning excessive, so polydipsia is excessive thirst. Polyuria, anyone want to take a guess? It's really hard to guess what it is. I haven't written it on the screen or anything. Polyuria is excessive urination. Polyphagia means that you're always hungry. And these three terms are used to diagnose diabetes type 1 in children before they can start talking. Uh, or if they're really young and they can't express their own problems. So we use these medical terms, polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia as precursors to diagnosing diabetes type 1. And you'll see more, those three again when we get to the diabetes chapter. That, that is what I got now um, in your chapter and in the, in the notes. Uh, in the PowerPoint, you're going to get literally a ton of terms, a ton of them. And it is too much for any one person to deal with correctly at once. This is a process to be learning medical terminology. Now your job in this class with me is to be like, I don't understand what that term is, and then you'll see that I, I slow things down, I break things down, I give you the common term, and then I'll give you the, the medical term quite often in this class, in the book as well. But you've got to be able to identify the words you don't know, all right, and then break them into words that you do know. If we're, if, if once we get to the point of where we're doing our assessments of damaged or sick patients, I don't need you to use medical terms all the time. If you can't remember the medical term, don't sit there and just roll your eyes and be like, oh, what's the term for it? Describe it in common terms. You know, he was breathing really fast. Is literally tachypnea. 
That's what it is. Oh, his heart's beating really, really fast. It's tachycardia. At a certain point, you will, along this trajectory in EMS, have to start using those words. But right now, describe what you see. If you can't remember the medical term for it, use the common term. We're not going to be like, what's the, what's the common term? I'm going to give you bonus points if you start coming up with you know, all these medical terms. I'll be like, well, look at the brain on Brad. I don't think we have a Brad in this class, which is fine. Um, so it's, it's a learning process. It's not all done at once. Uh, so just remember that as you, yeah, yeah. Thank you for opening this page. Like I'm not going to give you a test that looks like that, all right, with all these terms. And that's, I mean, this is for real medical terminology. This is how it's done. There's entire semester-long classes that are based on medical terminology. And we just talked about it for, what, a half hour? All right. So my expectations will increase over time, but that's as you get more comfortable using these terms. And if you use one incorrectly, I'm going to correct you, but I'll do it nicely. Be like, nice try. I probably, yeah, it'll be nice. Um, but yeah, do try starting to incorporate medical terminology into your reports and how you uh, describe patients.